Well, good morning, church. We're excited to worship with you this morning. Welcome to those of you online. We're going to sing this morning a couple of Christmas carols. Let's sing together. The first Noel, the angel did say, was to certain poor shepherds in fields as they lay, in fields where they lay keeping their sheep on a cold winter's night.
heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness, light and life to all He brings. Risen with healing in His wings, mild He lays His glory by. Born that men no more may die. Born to raise the sons of. We're going to sing a song this morning. It's not uh, necessarily a Christmas song per se. But one of the things that uh, we can often find ourselves in the midst of during this season is some chaos, uh, some, some turbulence. Things can sometimes feel a little bit chaotic. And one of the things that we often forget is God's faithfulness through this season. It's supposed to be about joy and peace. And that can be so easy to set aside to all the other things we have going on. So this song will be due to a lot of you. Um, but let's go ahead and use it as a, as a, as a time of reflection. And we'll start by singing the chorus. words, amen? Let's go ahead and lift that again. One more time. Faithful. And faithful you are. Faithful forever you will be. Faithful you are. All your promises. And all your promises are yes and amen. All 
God's promises, that's what Christmas time is about. Because you see, when sin entered the world, God made a promise right then that the seed of woman would crush the head of the serpent, that Satan, sin would be defeated. That's what it is about Jesus coming into this world. Now through this month, I want us to be thinking about what do we, what are the gifts we actually get by Jesus coming into this world. And I want us to think about what the angels said. When the angels came, made the announcements to, to the shepherds, they started group comes and they start praising God God praise to God in the highest and on, on earth to men um, peace to men on whom uh, God's favor rest and so they announce a peace for mankind and I know we think of peace as the uh, absence of war the absence of fighting and and through different wars we've heard of them you know on Christmas Day there is a ceasefire to actually celebrate Christmas but the peace Jesus is bringing into the world is a peace that comes between us and God. Because when our sins are forgiven through Jesus, we gain that relationship with him. We do not have to fear him as a God of anger and a God of wrath, but God, we know him as a father, a loving father. It brings peace, since we have a peace with God, a peace between us. Instead of the bickering, the fighting, not getting along, the competition, trying to do better than everybody else, we realize we're all created in the image of God and, and we, we're brothers and sisters when we accept Christ. But it also brings peace in here because when we get forgiveness from God, we no longer have guilt. We no longer have shame. We realize who we really are and we don't have to fight to become something we're not, but we realize who God has made us to be and that's the peace we have. But it goes on realizing all men this is a gift God offered to the world, to each and every person, born, still to be born, and not just us. We're lucky we had somebody tell us about it, help us to realize what God had given us through Jesus, through this Christmas time. Other people need to know. And the interesting thing is, it's the angels are praising God for what he did for us. So does that mean we should be praising him all the more because we're the ones receiving the gift, not the angels? They made that announcement, that, but they don't make the announcement anymore. That has become our responsibility. As we know Jesus, as we know God as our Father, that becomes our responsibility. And we need to praise God, realizing what he's done for us. We need to realize.
is what God wants more than anything for everybody to know about this gift, to have the opportunity. And so we spend time, we spend effort, we use the gifts God has given us, and we give financially that all the world has the opportunity to know what Christmas is really about. Not Santa Claus, not just Christmas trees, all of those traditions, which are fine. It's really about God giving us the gift of forgiveness, a f- gift of love in so many things, but especially today to think of the peace we have within ourselves in so many ways. So as we worship this morning, we should be all the more thrilled to worship our God because we know him as Father, as Savior, as a child who has become one of us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we had the opportunity, we had the opportunity of someone telling us about your son and about what Christmas is. And help us to do that, to share that love, to share that message, to share the truth with those around us in whatever ways we can. But help us to see you this morning in your full glory and be able to worship you from our hearts, our minds, our souls. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Good morning, WCC and those watching online. If you guys haven't had a chance to check your email recently, uh, we'd like to take a moment just to pray for Dave. Um, He has recently returned home, and they have decided not to go through with the surgery uh, and said he's going to try to manage the pain through medication and through diet. And so these next six weeks are really critical for uh, his recovery. And so I just wanted to take a moment individually just to uh, pray for Dave and for wisdom and for the favor on that situation. Let's pray. Amen. I hope this month is starting off well for you. Hopefully by now you've recovered from your 10 pounds of turkey uh, and mashed potatoes. That's good warm up for the 10 pounds of uh, ham and Christmas cookies you're about to eat. Hopefully not at the same time, but hey, everybody has their own thing, I guess. But it's that time of year again, and trust me, it's going to be here within a blink. And I hope you're taking time during this frantic holiday rush to slow yourself. Uh, But um, maybe you haven't gotten into the holiday rush yet. I know that I've definitely gotten to the holiday sugar rush, um, <laughs> and there's just so many wonderful things to eat this time of year. Uh, I hate that so many things are seasonal, uh, and if you haven't tried the cranberry white cheddar at all these, here's my shameless plug, buy it, uh, but <laughs> our minds are most likely on gifts right now. In a couple weeks, our minds will be uh, on receiving gifts, but at the moment, most of us are thinking about what to get each other. And it's so easy to get wrapped up, pun intended, on gifts that I fear that oftentimes, including myself, we, uh, we get distracted from the best gifts uh, that typically aren't wrapped or, or topped with a bow, uh, the gift of time off work, the gift of family and friends, and of course, the gift of our Savior. I remember when I was 10, living in uh, Northern California, uh, it's kind of funny for me to think about it now because I had this friend who would come and, and just bang on my door for me to come play, and, and I would go and bang on his door, and it's funny because people don't really do that anymore because we have cell phones, but I actually, I know I don't look like it, but I, when I was younger, um, we didn't have cell phones, and we had a landline, and you could only, one person could only be on it at a time, and my dad has a business in, in the home, so it was almost always busy, and there was no screen on the phone or anything like that, so you couldn't see who was calling or anything like that, but so the only way you could see if uh, your friends could come out and, and play with you as if you kind of went over and, and banged on their door. And I had this uh, kid that would come down the street. His name was Ben. And here's the thing. We weren't really friends. And uh, at least I didn't think of him that way. He Perhaps he thought of me that way. But the sad truth is I was only his friend because the dude had snacks. I mean, in his garage, he had a pegboard snack wall, which 
now that I'm older and I, I reflect back on that, it's really weird because who nowadays has a snack wall, especially in their garage? But hey, he had it, and my 10-year-old self, it was the most glorious thing I had ever seen. My parents bought snacks, of course, off-brand, but you know, hey, I'm not picky, but unfortunately, neither were my three other siblings, <laughs> but, uh, and my poor mom and dad, they, they tried to hide uh, their snacks the best they could, but I always found them. I mean, they weren't even creative. It's like they weren't even trying, really, but... Um, but it never took me long to find those hiding spots. And, but I would go over to this kid's house for his snacks. And, and he had bizarre snacks, snacks I'd never even seen before, like chocolate-covered sunflower seeds without the shell, like the kernels and stuff. And there were these little pieces of fruit in thumb-sized plastic containers of Jello, And they were terrible. But he had them. And he also had, uh, he had full-size candy bars, not fun-size which, you know, I, it's such a dumb name for a candy bar. There's nothing fun about a small candy bar. It's portion control, people, okay? <laughs> but anyway, um, my friend also had a lot of the most recent video games and stuff like that, and so I loved going over there, but it wasn't because I actually liked the guy, but I liked his stuff. And he was a little weird after all. I mean, we didn't really have much in common, and he was one of those kids you'd see at recess pretending he had superpowers, which, you know, is fine when you're six. People kind of start to look at you a little weird when you're 10, but not really. But I, I pretended that I had superpowers too. I just wasn't so open and public about it as he was. But I wish I could say that this tendency to associate with people because of their stuff rather than really seeking a genuine friendship ended when I was 10. But it also carried over into when I was in high school, when our class went on uh, a Six Flags trip. And I found myself doing this all over again with a friend because he had, he had asthma, and he had, uh, I should say friend, uh, because he had asthma, and he got this flash pass, and it was like the first year they had ever done anything like this, and so the hype was crazy. He could take six of his friends with him to cut any line, no matter how long, literally as fast as we could run up those steps and get in line, we could ride, and I'm still not sure to this day how I weaseled my way into getting picked, but I did. And we rode like 15 rides in like five to six hours, and I earned the whole envy of the whole class, and I had some really dirty looks by people when we cut in front of them, like, he has asthma, come on. But anyway, uh, once it was over, I ditched the guy. Like, he was just as fast as the Mr. Freeze, I ditched him, right? And I did this, and we tend to do this, if we're honest, because most times we enter relationships for selfish reasons. We tend to think first, you know, what can I get out of this relationship, instead of entering it for genuine companionship. I mean, just think about this. How would you feel if you spent a long time uh, picking out a gift for Valentine's Day, and hey, that's coming up, so now's the time to buy. But whether it's a necklace or a ring or whatever, and let's say you give it to your significant other, and they go crazy over it, right? They, they just, they love it. And they, for the next day, the next week, they're showing all their friends, they're talking about it, but not once do they mention you. Do they look at you? Do they thank you? That's not really the reaction we want, right? You want them, of course, to love it, but you also want them to reach across the table, grab your hand, look you in the eyes, and say, thank you. This gift means 10,000 times, uh, or you mean 10,000 times more to me than this gift, and it's special to me because it's from you. That's the reaction that we want. But here's the deal. I worry at times that this is how we treat our relationship with Jesus. What Jesus does for us must always be behind who Jesus is to us. We must go beyond just wanting a relationship because we want Jesus' stuff. And uh, that, that may be where the relationship starts, and there's nothing wrong with wanting what Jesus offers. After all, Jesus offers a lot of great things, a lot better than a garage snack wall. But when we want a relationship just because of what Jesus gives, and we don't come to him for a relationship based on who he is, we can miss a whole lot. And there's this phenomenal passage in Scripture that comes to mind that shows us how easy it is to get this all backwards. And it's in Luke chapter 17, verses 12 through 19. And Jesus and his disciples, they're traveling uh, to Jerusalem, and they find themselves on this border between Samaria and this little town of Galilee. And let's read. As he was going into the village, ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. For those of you who are not familiar with leprosy, it was a skin disease, and anyone who had it was completely cut off from society. Think about how many of us this past few years had, had had to quarantine for two weeks for having COVID. Now imagine that being your life. Imagine being cast out from your family, your friends, your house, from being able to buy or sell, from working a job that you love and providing for your family and, and yourself, not just for two weeks, but for a whole lifetime. There are many situations I do not want to find myself in, but this one is, is near the top. It's horrifying. It's terrifying to think about, to be outcasted like that. 
Um, but the Jewish authorities did this for fear that they could spread this disease to someone else or that whatever brokenness or sin had caused them to be cursed in this way uh, would infect them too, even though that was completely bad theology. But I think we can understand this fear, right, coming out of a pandemic. I mean, I know just recently when I was shopping just last week at Walmart, a woman behind me let out a really, like, throaty cough, and I noticed my pace doubled as I fled from the situation. And sadly, this is sort of just kind of a human reaction we have. Uh, But look at how Jesus reacts in the next verse, following in verse 14. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourself to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. Jesus notices them. I love that. He doesn't react like we do, even though we have a sickness way worse than leprosy, and that's the sickness of our sins, our sinful nature. But he tells them to go see a priest, which he's not being short with them here. He's, this was the common practice. If someone received healing, they had to go to a priest to get checked out, and if they passed, uh, they could re-enter society. And so, continuing in verse 15, one of them, when he saw he was healed, he came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. He was a Samaritan. Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to him, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. Man, that's rough. I don't know what we should find more shocking in this passage, that only one man returned or that nine didn't. I mean, let's not gloss over what just happened here. Jesus just gave these people their entire life back. Imagine that hopelessness. Imagine living a life where people wouldn't even look at you, where they ran from you like you were some sort of monster. Even your friends and family would m- maybe treat you this way. I mean, maybe they would show up occasionally to visit you. Maybe they'd throw you some scraps every once in a while. But when I read about these stories of, of people with leprosy, my heart literally just breaks for these people. And now just imagine being healed from that. I think it's hard for us to imagine it. Luckily, we can have a little help with that. I want, I want you guys to check out this scene from an excellent free series called The Chosen, which you really need to watch. And it's where Jesus heals a man with leprosy. It's a leper. Stay back. Cover your mouth. Don't breathe his air. Don't. Come any closer. It's okay, John. It's okay. Rabbi, 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 you cannot. It's disease. You can't. Please. Please. Please don't turn away from me. I won't. Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Only if you want to, I submit to you. My sister, she was a servant at the wedding. She told me what you can do. I know you can heal me if you are willing. Seek your own honor. Please just do me this one thing. But what do I tell people? 
go, show yourself to the priest. Let them inspect you and see that you are cleansed. Make the proper offering in the temple as Moses commanded. And go on your way. <laughs> <laughs> Where's an extra tunic? Just one of you, just one of you. That's enough. I love that scene based on Luke 5, 12 through 16, because it brings to life what we often miss when we read about Jesus healing people, the compassion, the joy, the jaw-dropping amazement. I mean, did you see in the, in the film how Jesus got really close to him, face to face, just the compassion there? Just, I love that. And when we, that passage that we read earlier, where Jesus healed 10 lepers, one returned, but nine didn't. Maybe they got caught up showing their friends and family. They were just so overwhelmed uh, from being finally ma- being admitted back into society uh, after being exiled for so long that, that they were just, it slipped their mind, or it, Jesus became an afterthought. And I think when I read this story for the first time, um, I sort of scoffed at it, you know? Like, how could they not return? I almost got angry. Like, how could they miss this? But as I dwelled on it, I, I remembered all the times Jesus had answered my prayers and how I never thanked him, or at least not until months or later, years later, if I did at all. And I don't know if you've ever prayed a prayer where you said something like this, Jesus, if you just get me out of this situation, if you just heal me, if you just save me from this trouble, I will follow you and I will never look back. I know I've prayed this before, having a strong track record of being a troublemaker. I can remember in times in my youth where Jesus answered my prayers and I didn't turn to thank him. I sure didn't follow through with giving my life over to him. And in this historical account provided by Luke, these lepers missed the true gift. It was not their healing, but the man who stood before them that gave it, the gift giver. The one who, was, who had come to do far more than just provide physical he- healing, but spiritual. But the real irony here is that the nine others that didn't return, they were most likely Jews, meaning they should have known better right? They knew the whole history and story of God. And get this, the, the word Jew comes from the Hebrew word Judah, which means to praise. They should have been the first ones there at Jesus' feet thanking him. They were happy that they received their gift, but they had missed and cared less about the one who had caused it all to happen. They were focused on what Jesus did rather than who he was, I know personally I struggle with this a lot because, let's face it, Jesus offers amazing gifts and promises that it's easy to overlook the most valuable part, who he is, his existence, his nature, his desire to be in a relationship with us. I know early in my walk with Christ, I became a Christian because Jesus offered eternal life. There was nothing that interested me more than added life, than hope after death, and If you talk to those who are in short supply of it, they'll tell you there's nothing they wouldn't give for some extra time. But Jesus offers us so much more than even the great great gift of eternal life. And I just wanted to list a few things that Jesus offers us, because I don't want to downplay his gifts. Jesus offers us forgiveness, a clean slate where my wrongs are not just forgiven, but they're forgotten. Jesus offers us one day a new earth, one without decay or death or disaster and hopefully insects. Jesus offers us a a glorified body that when he returns, we will shed this vessel for a new one, one that won't age, get sick, or have to sleep. Hopefully, we can still eat, maybe just not out of necessity, but these are just a few things that Jesus offers us, but it's so easy to get blindsided by all that that I fear for many years, I follow Jesus for the wrong reasons. Those things are great, but who Jesus is, that's pretty important too, and I just wanted to list a few things about Jesus' nature, about who he is. Jesus is a being of pure goodness, that in his essence, he has this unique attribute that no one else seems to possess. He is purely good, no fault, no selfishness, no evil, no corrupt sense of justice. We throw around the word good a lot, but scripture tells us that the concept of goodness, it's, it goes way deeper than what we think, and it's an attribute that solely belongs to God. Jesus is also truth. In a world of misinformation, nothing is, is more appealing than unbiased, pure truth, right? A foundation that we can rest in. Jesus is all-knowing. In a world of uncertainty and worry, Jesus knows the right course to fix humanity. He has the answers. Jesus is all-powerful. Nothing is beyond him. Nothing that he can't or won't reconcile, even if it's farther down the line than we would like. In fact, Jesus may be allowing this world to become so broken 
that we think it's unfixable solely so that he can come back and with one word fix everything that we thought was too far gone. Jesus is everywhere. We don't have to be alone. No matter where I go, I don't have to worry about being abandoned or cut off. I may not always feel his presence, especially in the storms, but he's there. And I can at least find some comfort in knowing that when this life is over, I'll never have to know that feeling again. There are many things that we could say about Jesus. He's our Savior, our King, our Lord. But I pray in this season of distraction and busyness that you rediscover your passion for him and not just his stuff. I think there are some really easy things we can do to kind of fix our perspective uh, back onto the personhood of Jesus. And number one, it would be to spend time with Jesus. Just like any earthly relationship, we need to spend time together for our relationship to grow. Number two, practice saying thank you to Jesus. I know we just got done with a, th- with a se- season of Thanksgiving, but it really should be a lifestyle and not just a thing that we do once a year. And I think this will help us shift our mindset away from the gifts and praising him for who he is, the gift giver. Three, evaluate and grow your prayer life. Deepen your prayers from just a list of things that Jesus can do for you and ask for more of his presence. Please hear me. Please hear me. It is not wrong to ask Jesus for things, and I don't want you to stop asking Jesus for things. But we can also talk to Jesus about more than just that. Connect with him and talk with him like a real friend. Like you Treat him like a real person. Be honest. Be vulnerable. He can handle it. Learn about Jesus, his dreams, his mission, his teachings. Align yourself with his will and purpose. This will help you better understand who Jesus is as a person instead of just what he can do for you. As the worship team makes their way up to the stage, I want to challenge you as you gather this year for Christmas to carry this same type of mentality over to your earthly relationships as well. When you look at the Christmas tree and you see presents underneath it, I challenge you to look deeper than that. Think of the loving mother, father, brother, sister, friend who wrapped it, who spent time picking it out and shopping and thinking about you because they want to show you they care, that they love you. When you see the lights on your tree and you watch them mesmerized by their beauty, Remember, it's Jesus who's the light of the world, who brought uh, hope into this world, and he can banish the darkness and light your path so that you do not stumble or are led down dangerous roads that lead to pain and death. And when you look at your tree, whether fresh, cut, or artificial, remember Jesus who died on one, not so that he can give you stuff or just give you stuff, but because he loves you. We are now going to enter a time of communion where once a week or however often you partake, we get a chance to fixate away from the madness of this world and back onto the true star of the season and our lives, Jesus. Take time to thank him for your gifts that he's given you, but also please don't misunderstand me. Do not stop asking things from Jesus. Jesus loves to bless us. There are many things to be thankful for, but there are also many things to not be thankful for. And that's okay. That's more than okay. That's being human. If you're dealing with trauma or hurt, and this time of year seems anything but magical, and gathering with your family is difficult, don't be afraid to ask for help, please. We long to march hand in hand with you through this. Jesus can meet your needs, whether that's through us here at the church or through therapy with gifted counselors who can help walk through your pain in your life and bring you to healing. Let us never limit how God can move how he can heal, how he can work for the good of those who love, love him. Let's pray. King Jesus, this world can be so hard, and I know there are people listening right now to this message who need you, who are hurting and struggling with things, and I pray that you meet their needs. I pray that you give them courage to speak up, that it's okay to feel beaten down, defeated. It's okay to question your faith. It's okay to go to Jesus with your emotions and to vent and to be honest. God's big enough for that. I know that you can meet us wherever we are, even if it's at the bottom of a depressing pit. Let us be kind to those around us, for we never know what storms people are dealing with. Remind us who you are this season. Remind us that although you came bearing gifts, you also came seeking a genuine relationship with every part of us, the good and the ugly. Please be with Dave and his family for favor on his situation. We pray for wisdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
close this morning, going back to that new song that we introduced. We're all going to go back to our day days where we all have obstacles, hurdles, things that distract us from the important things. So I want to close just with those words on his faithfulness and his peace. Let's use this as a time of prayer as we leave this morning. No, 
your promises are yes and amen. Father, we thank you for being available to us. And in your presence, I pray that you can help help us just understand that you're worthy in the midst of chaos, in the midst of turmoil. Help us to see that you're good. And God, help us to just uh, find a little bit of simplicity this Christmas, this holiday season hopes that we can fix our eyes and our hearts on you through all the things that happen because you're worthy of our worship you're worthy of life transformation and we thank you for your love we pray this in jesus name amen thank you again for worshiping with us this morning guys we hope that you found a blessing this morning have a good day